ago, the uh, Washington Post put out an article, and the article said something about uh, what do Americans fear the most? And as they were talking through, you know, just different fears that Americans have, the greatest fear that Americans have was what? Public speaking. It's getting up in front of people and speaking. It said 25.3% of Americans are fearful or afraid of speaking out in public in some sort of setting similar to this. They're just terrified of it. It wasn't spiders. It wasn't dogs. For me, it would be spiders, just so you know, or ticks. I am deathly afraid of ticks. But, uh, it, you know, and so, but it was public speaking. But when I was younger, I will say this, it was my greatest fear. When I was younger, the idea of getting up and speaking in front of people scared me to death. And I realized this my junior year in high school. My junior year in high school, I, went, I, was, I was on student council at our school. And so I was responsible for giving out uh, and awarding the prom king and queen. And so what happened is the night was going on. I knew this was coming up. I was getting really nervous. And all of a sudden, the time happened for me to make the announcement. And so they gave me a microphone, and they gave me a bouquet of flowers, and they said, we want you to go up there, get everybody's attention, come over, and you're going to announce who it is. And I was terrified. Like, I was so scared. You literally could hear my heart beating as I talked. It was like, oh, okay. I need your attention, please come over, make, you know, and I mean, it was like horrible. Like I was just like, I was shaking so bad. I tried to hold the flowers and the microphone together, but the flowers then were just rubbing on my face. And so I held the flowers out here and the microphone here as I began to talk and my hands just shaking so bad that one of my good friends began to heckle me. And he said, dude, Hauser, you're shaking so bad. The petals are falling off the flowers. And I was like, I just said, I, I'm just really nervous. And I was scared. I was horribly terrified to speak in, in front of people. And so this played a part into my deciding whether or not I was going to be a preacher. Uh, and when I was in, in college, I remember we had classes and we had speech classes just like everybody else. You probably had speech class your freshman year. You probably even took it in high school. And I remember that I was so afraid to talk in front of our class that literally I would tell somebody that was on, in my class, I'd say, here's the deal. When I get up there to talk, this speech is supposed to be five minutes. Would you, after five minutes, just give me the sign? Five. And I would be talking along. All of a sudden, they would give me the sign five. And it didn't matter where I was in the speech. I was done. And I was like, and that's all. And I would just make my way to the seat. You know, and the professor would be like, you can't, you can't do that. But I was just like, it's just a countdown. I just want to get this over with. I don't care what my grade is. Just, just let me sit down. You know? I was terrified. My sophomore year in college, we had a preaching class. And in our preaching class, you, know, you would sit there and you would preach in front of your entire uh, class, in front of your classmates, which was always so weird. You know? You're like, okay, we're going in here. We're practicing preaching. This is just kind of awkward. And so you would, I would be in there and I'd be so nervous at, during my preaching class that after Afterwards, the professor, he would, he would have filmed it, and he would say, hey, I want you to come in here, I want you to sit, and I want you to watch yourself preach, which is the, it's like punishment. And you go in there, and he's complimenting, or, or making compliments and, and critiquing as, as you're speaking. He said, there's one thing that is really distracting about you when you speak. And I said, okay, uh, what's that? And he said, you move a lot. Like, it's like you're dancing on a stage. And so, literally, literally, I would stand right behind the podium thing like this, and I would just do this as I'm talking the whole time. The funniest thing was, is because he recorded, he said, watch this and fast, fast forward. And it was like, just, just my, you know, it was hysterical. I was just sitting there, and I was like, and I remember when he was showing me this, I said, you know, it's just because I get nervous. I don't, I don't like speaking in front of people. And I said, so... I said, and that's part of the reason why I just don't think that, like, this preaching pastor thing is for me. Like, I just, I can't do it. I would be so bad at it. There has to be some other ministry type thing that doesn't require me to get up and to talk in front of people. Like, I just, I don't do it. I said, I just can't. I just can't do it. I can't. And here's the encouragement he, he gave me. It was this. You're right. You can't. And he just let that hang there for a minute. I was like, okay, that's not exactly what I was hoping for. I was hoping for you to say, like, you'll get better at it. Hang in there, champ. Like, something like that. But no, it was like, you're right, you can't. But then after a minute or so of just sitting there, he said, but here's the thing. That's why you're perfect for the job. Because you can't and you realize it. But God can through you if you allow him. And it's amazing what God can do through you because he's for you. 
And this morning we're going to take a look at uh, the story of David and Goliath. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's pages 284 and the Bibles are located in front of you. Unless you're in the middle section, then the Bibles are in the back. If you want to get up and go get one, you're fine. But, uh, you know, so it's on page 284 and I'm just going to start reading. It says this, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulders. Uh, the, The shaft of his spear was a heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Goliath was enormous. It is estimated that he was probably somewhere around 9 feet 6 inches tall. His coat weighed 125 pounds. Imagining wearing 125 pounds worth of clothing around. His spearhead alone was 15 pounds. The modern day Olympic uh, shot put weighs 16 pounds. So nearly, nearly the weight of his spearhead was that of just a shot put. This enormous, strong, powerful man. And he is there representing, he calls himself a champion. I am not just a champion, I am the champion. And a champion is someone who is like a pioneer. It's someone who goes out ahead. It's someone who represents the whole. And so essentially what what, uh, Goliath was saying was this, I am here because I'm a bad man. Send out your baddest man to fight me and we'll do this out. And I represent the whole, meaning if I win, Representing the whole, you lose, you surrender. If your guy beats me, represent your champion beats me, representing the whole, then we surrender to you. And that's what he's doing. And day after day, for 40 days, he was out there making this challenge over and over and over again. In verse uh, 8, it says this. It says, why are you all coming out to fight? He called. He said, I am the, I am the make sure you notice that, the Philistine champion. Not like this random guy. Like, I am the, I'm the baddest dude there is. But you, you are only servants of Saul. Saul was probably the tallest man in Israel, most likely. Uh, and so he was the king. Like, he was supposed to be their baddest warrior man. But instead, he, he ridicules them and says, you are all just servants. Choose one man to come down here and to fight me. And so he's making fun of them. He's ridiculing. It says, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run in fright. They were scared to death. Have you seen the giant, the men asked. Have you seen him? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters as a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. And it says, David then, standing around, Hearing this stuff, he asked the soldier standing nearby, he says, say what? Like, like, what do you get? Like, if I kill that dude, what do I get? And they're like, yeah, you get a woman and you get your taxes paid for. Like, you never have to give your money up. You get to keep your money. And David's probably thinking, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So what will the man get for killing a Philistine and ending this defiance in Israel? And it says uh, that, that that's what David was asking. It says, and these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. Like if you kill him, then you get this. And David's thinking, I think I can do this. I think, I, I know I'm probably five foot three, but I think I can match up to this guy. And so David's oldest brother, Eliab, is there. And he heard David talking to the men, you know, so older brother, younger brother's out there, he's come to visit, he's not even a soldier, and he's out there bringing stuff to see him, and it says this, his older brother says, he was angry, he says, what are you doing around here, he demanded, and what about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of, I know about your pride and deceit, you just want to see the battle, and so David's own family, they don't really like David that much, probably because The chapter before, if you read the chapter before, you'll see that David, out of all the brothers, was the one who was anointed by Samuel. And he probably went around bragging about, like, hey, do you guys know I'm anointed? I'm pretty awesome. I'm anointed. You weren't. He's the baby of the family. And so you know how the babies of the family are favored anyway. So the brothers don't really like him that much. And so they start to even downplay who he is. And they're like, don't you have responsibilities? Like, shouldn't you be back at home in a field watching those few sheep, not even a large herd of sheep, but those few sheep that are there, I mean, they're, they're ridiculing as well. 
because clearly they didn't care for David. But David doesn't care. He goes on to Saul and he approaches Saul and says, hey, don't worry about this Philistine. He goes to King Saul and says, don't worry about this Philistine. I got this. I mean, that's literally what he says. If you read it, it says, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. This young guy comes walking in like nine foot six, put him on me. I'll shut him down. You know, I mean, he's like, thinks he's this bad dude. And so he says that. And then Paul, or Saul even says to him, he says, don't be ridiculous. He said to him, he said, there's no way you can fight the Philistine and possibly win. I mean, he's like saying like, there's no, you, you can fight him. There's no way that you are going to win. You are only a boy. And this, this man, he has been a man of war from his youth. Like Saul was saying, we have known about Goliath since he was a boy because he was a man child then. And he has been slaughtering and killing people, other men, proving that he is the baddest Philistine since he was a young man. He was a man child. But David persisted and he comes back with something really awesome. Like he says, this guy's a man of war and he slaughters all kinds of people. And David says, I've been taking care of sheep and goats. Can you imagine like, that's what, like, like clearly David just isn't, like, yeah, I've been, I've been taking care, and, and Saul's like, exactly. That's why you are not the guy to go do this. But David continues on. He says, when a lion and bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of a lion and a bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And you realize this, when God is for you, you don't have to run from your past. David had a past, whether it was arrogance in his past or whether it was a job that was unfulfilling or unappreciated, he had a past. But you think about it, your past my past is preparing me and helps to prepare me for the future mission that God has for us. If you think about it this way, typically the best people to talk to somebody in a certain situation or circumstances is somebody who has been through it. The, kids who's, the kid whose parents are divorcing. The addict who longs and desires to become sober. The teenager who finds out that she is pregnant. The man who took a risk in his job and it ended up being a bad risk and he lost everything. Or it could be the man who has or the woman who has all that there is. Like they are so happy they've got it all. They've got the house, the car, the kids. They have it all and yet they sit there and they feel completely empty. It's always good to have someone who can say, man, I've been there. I've walked through that. I understand that. And David saw the way that he had worked in his life up to this point, and it had prepared him for this moment. And I'm sure there are times where David sat out there in the field and thought, watching sheep and goats, God, hmm? that's what you got for me? I've been anointed, you know, and I'm watching sheep and goats. God, you hearing me? I'm watching sheep and goats down here. And he's just out there watching sheep and goats. And I imagine some of us probably say, God, is this what you got for me? Selling insurance, this is what you got. Working in the medical field, yeah, that's great. Get to see people die all the time. This is real good, God. You get a teacher, I get to work with these punk kids that don't respect me. This is what you got for me, God. I can imagine some of us, a factory, doing the same thing every single, God, is this what you have for me? And what we don't realize is it possible that in the midst of that, that God is preparing us for a mission and when that mission comes, like David, will you go for it? And so Saul was convinced. And so he says, all right, David, you want to do this? And so Saul begins to put his armor on David. He's putting it on him. He's preparing him for a battle. And David said this. He said, I can't go in these. I can't go in these. He says, I'm not used to them. And I understand this. Like, this makes sense to me. It's kind of like when somebody says, hey, you know what, you're preaching this morning. You're like, yeah, I'm preaching this morning. You're like, put on your Sunday best. Make sure you have your suit and your tie. And I'm like, you do that to me and I'm, you're not going to get my best. I'm not used, this is me. Like, this is what I wear. This is what, I just, I'm, I'm not that, like, I can't. The only time I wear those are funerals and weddings and you don't get my best there. 
It's true. And so he feels this way. And it says, so David took them off. I love it. It says, David took them off again. Like you see this battle going back and forth. Like Saul's like, no, you got to have this on. David's like, I'm not wearing it. And you're like, yes, you are. No, you're not. It's like your kids. In the morning when you're getting them dressed, you're like, you're going to wear this shirt. And they're like, I don't want this shirt. You know? And you're just going back and forth, back and forth. He says, I'm not used to them. He picked up five smooth stones. This way he's, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and he put them in his shepherd's bag. And then armed only with a shepherd's staff, a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. You see, when God is for you, you don't have to be something you're not. When I first moved to Louisville, it was like 13 or 14 years ago. I can't even remember for sure. It was a while back. I had been asked to come here to be a youth pastor. And I was, I was in this small town of Salem, Illinois. It was 8,000 people. And I was moving from there to a church that average attendance on a weekend was 15,000. I had a church attendance in Illinois as a youth pastor that we averaged about 500 people in attendance and about the average of students that were in the student ministry here was over 500. So you can imagine I was a little bit afraid and a little bit overwhelmed to begin with to move here but quickly after I got here I got caught up in the commotion of like do you know who else has been on this stage? Like our senior pastor is Dave Stone when that time was Bob Russell it's like Bob Russell Dave Stone, and then they got this young guy that speaks named Kyle. And the youth pastors that were here before that shared this stage that I'm going to be speaking on, they wrote books. They got asked to conferences like they were the best of the best. And I'm here. And I started to think that I was pretty awesome. I started doing all these things and preparing messages and all this stuff and spending a ridiculous amount of time on things that I thought was important. And yet I neglected to love the people that were in the seats because most of the time when I was speaking and preaching, I was preaching to that camera because I knew that that camera was recording a sermon that was eventually going to go out on the internet all over the world. And I thought there are thousands of people who are going to want to get online to listen to me. It's going to be awesome. So I go from this being deathly afraid to speak in front of people, to arrogance about it. And I remember one Sunday morning, it was probably three months after we got here, and I had prepared this message. I was like, the the students are going to laugh. They're going to think it's so funny. And people are going to be calling me and knocking on my door, asking me to come and to speak, which, by the way, never happens. And they're going to ask me to do this thing, and it's going to be great. And I thought, man, this is going to be so cool. And I remember I preached this sermon. Man, I gave it all I had. Got in the car afterwards, I was feeling pretty good about it. My wife was in there, and I kind of gave her that bump, you know, you do when you're pretty proud of yourself. And you're like, hey, what would you think of that? And she's like, eh. You know, I thought, she's, yeah, she, she knows. She knows it was good. It was good. Kind of hit her again. I said, I said seriously, babe, what would you think of it? And she said, honestly, I'm just going to tell you this. If your wife, girlfriend ever says, honestly, you know about What's going to be said, not going to make you feel real good. And she said, honestly? And I said, yeah, you didn't like it? Uh, Yeah, uh, okay, go ahead, give it to me. And she said, it was terrible. She said it was awful. As a matter of fact, it might have been the worst message I've ever heard in my life. And I kind of like, ha, ha, you're kidding, right? She's like, no, seriously. And she said, I don't know who that person on stage is. You see, because I had caught up in this thing thinking that I had to be something more than I was. And David knew exactly who he was. And so David chose the weapons that he had trained with for many years. And he took five stones, he took that shepherd's staff, and he took his sling, and he headed out to that battle line. And when he gets out there, Goliath begins to ridicule him. He says, what am I? Am I a dog that you send a boy out to fight me? And David replied to the Philistine, he said this, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you, and I will cut off your head, and then I will give you the dead bodies of your men to the birds of the air and the wild animals. Awesome, right? This is in the Bible. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and a spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. 
God rescues his people. He rescues his people, but not with a sword and a spear. But check this out. With a shepherd boy. So David takes his staff, he takes his sling, he goes out, he puts that rock in his sling, he slings it, he hits Goliath between the eyes, knocks him to the ground. David runs over, grabs Goliath's sword, his own sword, and chops off his head. And it says this next, it says, When the Philistines saw that their champion, their one who was to go before them, their one who was to be the pioneer, their one who represented the whole was dead, they turned and they ran And then the men of Israel, God's people and Judah, gave a great shout of triumph. You see, when God is for you, you don't have to be afraid. Romans 8 says this, If God is for us, then who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? You see, you you do not need to be afraid Because we know that God is for us. And the way that we know that God is for us is easy. It's this. You know that God is for you because he has gone before you. You know that God is for you because he has gone before you. And it makes sense when you think about it. Because often when we read the story of David and Goliath, here's what we do. We read the story of David and Goliath and I think of myself like, I am David. Like, I've got these giants that are out here in the world that I have to conquer, right? I've got this sin that's in my life. I've got this debt that's in my life. I've got this person who's in my life. And I, like David, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to conquer when the reality, the more accurate way of reading this is we are more like Israel. We kind of stand around and we're saying, who is going to go out before us? And who is going to represent all of us? Who is going to be the whole of us? Who will be our champion? We need a champion who goes out before us And David is more like Jesus. And as it tells the story, it says that even even in Scripture, David said, hey, I don't come with sword and spear to win the battle. And what was it? It was a shepherd boy. And if you think back to the story of Jesus, Hebrews 2 says this. It says, Jesus, who is our champion. Jesus is the one who goes out before us. Jesus is the one who represents the whole. That is Jesus. He is our champion. And he has gone out before us, just like David went out before the people of Israel, God's people, and he rescued them. It was Jesus, another shepherd boy, who went out before us and rescued all of us, but not with sword and spear, but by giving his life for us on the cross. He's our champion. And he is for us because he has gone before us. This entire series, we have said this. God wants to take whatever happens to you, whatever has happened to you, to accomplish his work in you so that he can fulfill his purpose through you. And so I ask this question, what would it look like? What would it look like in our lives if we really believed that God was for us? What would it look like?